Chapter 6 of King Alfred of England by Jacob Abbott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ryan Cherrick. King Alfred of England by Jacob Abbott. Chapter 6 Alfred's Accession to the Throne. At the battle in which Alfred's brother, Ethelred, whom Alfred succeeded on the throne, was killed, as is briefly mentioned at the close of chapter 4, Alfred himself, then a brave and energetic young man, fought by his side. The party of Danes whom they were contending against in this final fight was the same one that came out in the expedition organized by the sons of Lothbrook, and whose exploits in destroying monasteries and convents were described in the last chapter. Soon after the events there narrated, the formidable body of marauders moved westward, toward that part of the kingdom where the dominions more particularly pertaining to the family of Alfred lay. There was in those days a certain stronghold or castle on the river Thames, about forty miles west from London, which was not far from the confines of Ethelred's dominions. The large and populous town of Reading now stands upon the spot. It is at the confluence of the river Thames, with the Kennet, a small branch of the Thames, which here flows into it from the south, the spot, having the waters of the rivers for a defense upon two sides of it, was easily fortified. A castle had been built there, and, as usual in such cases, a town had sprung up about the walls. The Danes advanced to this stronghold and took possession of it, and they made it for some time their headquarters. It was at once the center from which they carried on their enterprises in all directions about the island, and the refuge to which they could always retreat when defeated and pursued. In the possession of such a fastness, they, of course, became more formidable than ever. King Ethelred determined to dislodge them. He raised, accordingly, as large a force as his kingdom would furnish, and taking his brother Alfred as his second in command, he advanced towards Reading in a very resolute and determined manner. He first encountered a large body of Danes, who were out on a marauding excursion. This party consisted only of a small detachment the main body of the army of the Danes having been left at Reading to strengthen and complete the fortifications. They were digging a trench from river to river, so as completely to insulate the castle, and make it entirely inaccessible on either side, except by boats or a bridge. With the earth thrown out of the trench, they were making an embankment on the inner side, so that an enemy, after crossing the ditch, would have to step ascent to climb, Defended, too, as of course it would be in such an emergency, by long lines of desperate men upon the top, hurling at the assailants showers of javelins and arrows. While, therefore, a considerable portion of the Danes were at work within and around their castle, to make it as nearly as possible impregnable as a place of defense, the detachment above referred to had gone forth for plunder, under the command of some of the bolder and more adventurous spirits in the horde. This party Ethelred overtook. A furious battle was fought. The Danes were defeated and driven off the ground. They fled towards Reading. Ethelred and Alfred pursued them. The various parties of Danes that were outside of the fortifications, employed in completing at the outworks, or encamped in the neighborhood, were surprised and slaughtered, or at least vast numbers of them were killed, and the rest retreated within the works, all maddened at their defeat and burning with desire for revenge. The Saxons were not strong enough to dispossess them of their fastness. On the contrary, in a few days the Danes, having matured their plans, made a desperate sally against the Saxons, and after a very determined and obstinate conflict, they gained the victory, and drove the Saxons off the ground. Some of the leading Saxon chieftains were killed, and the whole country was thrown into great alarm at the danger which was impending that the Danes would soon gain the complete and undisputed possession of the whole land. The Saxons, however, were not yet prepared to give up the struggle. They rallied their forces, gathered new recruits, reorganized their ranks, and made preparations for another struggle. The Danes, too, feeling fresh strength and energy in consequence of their successes, formed themselves in battle array, and, leaving their stronghold, they marched out into the open country in pursuit of their foe. 
the two armies gradually approached each other and prepared for battle. Everything portended a terrible conflict, which was to be, in fact, the great final struggle. The place where the armies met was called, in those times, Isestu, which means Ashtown. It was, in fact, a hillside covered with ash trees. The name has become shortened and softened in the course of the ten centuries, which have intervened since this celebrated battle, into Ashton. If, indeed, as is generally supposed, the Ashton of the present day is the locality of the ancient battle. The armies came into the vicinity of each other toward the close of the day. They were both eager for the contest, or at least they pretended to be so, but they waited until morning. The Danes divided their forces into two bodies. The kings commanded one division, and certain chieftains called earls directed the other. King Ethelred undertook to meet this order of battle by a corresponding distribution of his own troops, and he gave accordingly to Alfred the command of one division, while he himself was to lead the other. All things being thus arranged, the hum and bustle of the two great encampments subsided at last, at the late hour, as the men sought repose under the rude tents, in preparation for the fatigues and exposures of the coming day. Some slept, others watched restlessly, and talked together, sleepless under the influence of that strange excitement, half exhilaration and half fear, which prevails in a camp on the eve of battle. The campfires burned brightly all the night, and the sentinels kept vigilant watch, expecting every moment some sudden alarm. The night passed quietly away. Ethelred and Alfred both arose early. Alfred went out to arouse and muster the men in his division of the encampment, and to prepare for battle. Ethelred, on the other hand, sent for his priest, and assembling the officers in immediate attendance upon him, commenced divine service in his tent the service of the mass, according to the forms and usages which, even in that early day, were prescribed by the Catholic Church. Alfred was thus bent on immediate and energetic action, while Ethelred thought that the hour for putting forth the exertion of human strength did not come until time had been allowed for completing, in the most deliberate and solemn manner, the work of imploring the protection of heaven. Ethelred seems, by his conduct on this occasion, to have inherited from his father, even more than Alfred, the spirit of religious devotion at least so far, as to the strict and faithful observance of religious forms, was concerned. There was, it is true, a particular reason in this case why the forms of divine service should be faithfully observed, and that is, that the war was considered in a great measure a religious war. The Danes were pagans. The Saxons were Christians, and making their attacks upon the dominions of Ethelred, the ruthless invaders were animated by a special hatred of the name of Christ, and they evinced a special hostility towards every edifice or institution or observance which bore the Christian name. The Saxons, therefore, in resisting them, felt that they were not only fighting for their own possessions and for their own lives, but that they were defending the kingdom of God, and that he looking down from his throne in the heavens, regarded them as the champions of his cause, and, consequently, that he would either protect them in the struggle, or, if they fell, that he would receive them to mansions of special glory and happiness in heaven, as martyrs who had shed their blood in his service and for his glory. Taking this view of the subject, Ethelred insisted of going out to battle at the early dawn, collected his officers into his tent, and formed them into a religious congregation. Alfred, on the other hand, full of impetuosity and ardor, was arousing his men, animating them by his words of encouragement and by the influence of his example, and making, as energetically as possible, all the preparations necessary for the approaching conflict. In fact, Alfred, though his brother was king, and he himself only a lieutenant general under him, had been accustomed to take the lead in all the military operations of the army, on account of the superior energy, resolution, and tact which he evinced, even in this early period of his life. His brothers, though they retained the scepter, as it fell successively into their hands, 
relied mainly on his wisdom and courage in all their efforts to defend it. And Ethelred may have been somewhat more at his ease in listening to the priest's prayers in his tent, from knowing that the arrangements for marshalling and directing a large part of the force were in such good hands. The two encampments of Alfred and Ethelred seem to have been at some little distance from each other. Alfred was impatient at Ethelred's delay. He asked the reason for it. They told him that Ethelred was attending Mass, and that he had said he should on no account leave his tent until the service was concluded. Alfred, in the meantime, took possession of a gentle elevation of land, which now would give him an advantage in the conflict. A single thorn tree, growing there alone, marked the spot. The Danes advanced to attack him, expecting that, as he was not sustained by Ethelred's division of the army, he would be easily overpowered and driven from his post. Alfred himself felt an extreme and feverish anxiety at Ethelred's delay. He fought, however, with the greatest determination and bravery. The thorn tree continued to be the center of the conflict for a long time, and, as the morning advanced, it became more and more doubtful how it would end. At last, Ethelred, having finished his devotional services, came forth from his camp at the head of his division and advanced vigorously to his faltering brother's aid. This soon decided the contest. The Danes were overpowered and put to flight. They fled at first in all directions, wherever each separate band saw the readiest prospect of escape from the immediate vengeance of their pursuers. They soon, however, all began with one accord to seek the roads which would conduct them to their stronghold at Reading. They were madly pursued and massacred as they fled by Alfred and Ethelred's army. Vast numbers fell. The remnants secured their retreat, shut themselves up within their walls, and began to devote their eager and earnest attention to the work of repairing and making good their defenses. This victory changed for the time being the whole face of affairs, and led, in various ways, to very important consequences. The most important of which was, as we shall presently see, that it was the means indirectly of bringing Alfred soon to the throne. As to the cause of the victory, or rather the manner in which it was accomplished, the writers of the times give very different accounts, according as their respective characters incline them to commend in man a feeling of quiet trust and confidence in God when placed in circumstances of difficulty or danger, or a vigorous and resolute exertion of his own powers. Alfred looked for deliverance to the determined assaults and heavy blows which he could bring to bear upon his pagan enemies with weapons of steel around the thorn tree in the field. Ethelred trusted to his hope of obtaining, by his prayers in his tent, the effectual protection of heaven, and they who have written the story differ, as they who read it will on the question to whose instrumentality the victory is to be ascribed. One says that Alfred gained it by his sword, another that Alfred exerted his strength and his valor in vain and was saved from defeat and destruction only by the intervention of Ethelred, bringing with him the blessing of heaven. In fact, the various narratives of these ancient events, which are found at the present day in old chronicles that record them, differ always very essentially not only in respect to matters of opinion and to the point of view in which they are to be regarded, but also in respect to questions of fact. Even the place where this battle was fought, notwithstanding what we have said about the derivation of Ashton from Iskandun, is not absolutely certain. There is in the same vicinity another town, called Ashbury, which claims the honor. One reason for supposing that this last is the true locality is that there are the ruins of an ancient monument here, which, tradition says, was a monument built to commemorate the death of a Danish chieftain slain here by Alfred. There is also in the neighborhood another very singular monument called the White Horse, which also has the reputation of having been fashioned to commemorate Alfred's victories. The White Horse is a rude representation of a horse, formed by cutting away the turf from the steep slope of a hill, so as to expose a portion of the white surface of the chalky rock below of such a form that the figure is called a horse, though they who see it seem to think it might as well have been called a dog. The name, however, of the White Horse has come down with it from the ancient times, 
and the hill on which it is cut is known as the White Horse Hill. Some ingenious antiquitarians think they find evidence that this gigantic profile was made to commemorate the victory obtained by Alfred and Ethelred over the Danes at the ancient S.S. Doon. However this may be, and whatever view we may take of the comparative influence of Alfred's energetic action and Ethelred's religious faith in the defeat of the Danes at this great battle, it is certain that the results of it were very momentous to all concerned. Ethelred received a wound, either in this battle or in some of the smaller contests and collisions which followed it, under the effects of which he pinned and lingered for some months, and then died. Alfred, by his decision and courage on the day of battle, and by the ardor and resolution with which he pressed all the subsequent operations during the period of Ethelred's decline, made himself still more conspicuous in the eyes of his countrymen than he had ever been before. In looking forward to Ethelred's approaching death, the people, accordingly, began to turn their eyes to Alfred as his successor. There were children of some of his older brothers living at that time, and they, according to all received principles of hereditary right, would naturally secede to the throne. But the nation seems to have thought that the crisis was too serious, and the dangers which threatened their country were too imminent to justify putting any child upon the throne. The accession of one of those children would have been the signal for a terrible and protracted struggle among powerful relatives and friends for the regency during the minority of the youthful sovereign. And this, while the Danes remained in their stronghold at Reading, in daily expectation of new reinforcements from beyond the sea, would have plunged the country into hopeless ruin. They turned their eyes toward Alfred, therefore, as their sovereign to whom they were to bow so soon as Ethelred should cease to breathe. In the meantime, the Danes, far from being subdued by the adverse turn of fortune which had befallen them, strengthened themselves in their fortress, made desperate sallies from their entrenchments, attacked their foes on every possible occasion, and kept the country in continual alarm. They at length so far recruited their strength and intimidated and discouraged their foes, whose king and nominal leader, Ethelred, was now less able than ever to resist them as to take the field again. They fought more pitched battles, and, though the Saxon chroniclers who narrate these events are very reluctant to admit that the Saxons were really vanquished in these struggles, they allow that the Danes kept the ground which they successively took post upon, and the discouraged and disheartened inhabitants of the country were forced to retire. In the meantime, too, new parties of Danes were continually arriving on the coast, and spreading themselves in marauding and plundering excursions all over the country. The Danes at Reading were reinforced by these bands, which made the conflict between them and Ethelred's forces more unequal still. Alfred did his utmost to resist the tide of ill fortune, with the limited and doubtful authority which he held, but all was in vain. Ethelred, worn down, probably with anxiety and depression which the situation of his kingdom brought upon him, lingered for a time, and then died, and Alfred was, by general consent, called to the throne. This was in the year 871. It was a matter of moment to find a safe and secure place of deposit for the body of Ethelred, who, as a Christian slain and contending with pagans, was to be considered a martyr. His memory was honored, as that of one who had sacrificed his life in defense of the Christian faith. They knew very well that even his lifeless remains would not be safe from the vengeance of his foes unless they were placed effectually beyond the reach of these desperate marauders. There was, far to the south, in Dorsetshire, on the southern coast of England, a monastery at Wimborne, a very sacred spot, worthy to be selected as a place of a royal sepulchre. The spot has continued sacred to the present day, and it is now upon the site, as is supposed, of the ancient monastery, a grand cathedral church or minister full of monuments of former days, and impressing all beholders with its solemn architectural grandeur. Here they conveyed the body of Ethelred and interred it. It was a place of sacred seclusion, where they reigned a solemn stillness and awe, which no Christian hostility would 
have ever dared to disturb. The sacrilegious paganism of the Danes, however, would have respected it but little, if they had ever found access to it, but they did not. The body of Ethelred remained undisturbed, and, many centuries afterward, some travelers who visited the spot recorded the fact that there was a monument there with this inscription. In hoc loco quisc corpus Ethelredi regis, West Saxonium martyrus, qui anno domini aprilis per manus danorum peganorum occubat. Such is the commonly received opinion of the death of Ethelred, and yet some of the critical historians of modern times, who find cause to doubt or disbelieve a very large portion of what is stated in ancient records, attempt to prove that Ethelred was not killed by the Danes at all, but that he died of the plague, which terrible disease was at that time prevailing in that part of England. At all events, he died, and Alfred, his brother, was called to reign in his stead. End of chapter 6 Recording by Ryan Cherrick Chapter 7 of King Alfred of England by Jacob Abbott This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org Recording by Ryan Cherrick King Alfred of England by Jacob Abbott Chapter 7 Reverses the historians say that Alfred was very unwilling to assume the crown when the death of Ethelred presented it to him. If it had not been an object of ambition or desire, there probably would have been a rival claimant, whose right would perhaps prove superior to his own. Since it appears that one or more of the brothers who reigned before him left a son, whose claim to the inheritance, if the inheritance had been worth claiming, would have been stronger than that of their uncle, the son of the oldest son, takes precedence always of the brother, for hereditary rights. Like water, never move laterally so long as they can continue to descend. The nobles, however, and chieftains, and all the leading powers of the kingdom of Wessex, which was the particular kingdom which descended from Alfred's ancestors, united to urge Alfred to take the throne. His father had, indeed, designated him as the successor of his brothers by his will. Though, how far a monarch may properly control by his will the disposal of his realm is a matter of great uncertainty. Alfred yielded at length to these solicitations, and determined on assuming the sovereign power, he first went to Wimborne to attend the funeral solemnities which were to be observed at his royal brother's burial. He then went to Winchester, which, as well as Wimborne, is in the south of England, to be crowned and anointed king. Winchester was, even in those early days, a great ecclesiastical center. It was for some time the capital of the West Saxon realm. It was a very sacred place, and the crown was there placed upon Alfred's head, with the most imposing and solemn ceremonies. It is a curious and remarkable fact that the spots which were consecrated in those early days by the religious establishments of the times have preserved in almost every case their sacredness to the present day. Winchester is now famed all over England for its great cathedral church, and the vast religious establishment which has its seat there, the annual revenues and expenditures of which far exceed those of many of the states of this union, the income of the bishop alone was for many years double that of the salary of the President of the United States. The Bishop of Winchester is widely celebrated, therefore, all over England, for his wealth, his ecclesiastical power, the architectural grandeur of the cathedral church, and the wealth and importance of the College of Ecclesiastics, over which he presides. It was in Winchester that Alfred was crowned. As soon as the ceremony was performed, he took the field, collected his forces, and went to meet the Danes again. He found the country in a most deplorable condition. The Danes had extended and strengthened their positions. They had got possession of many of the towns, and, not content with plundering castles and abbeys, they had seized lands and were beginning to settle upon them, as if they intended to make Alfred's new kingdom their permanent abode. 
The forces of the Saxons, on the other hand, were scattered and discouraged. There seemed no hope left to them of making head against their pestiferous invaders. If they were defeated, their cruel conquerors showed no moderation and no mercy in their victory. And if they conquered, it was only to suppress for a moment one horde, with a certainty of being attacked immediately by another, more recently arrived and more determined and relentless than those before them. Alfred succeeded, however, by means of the influence of his personal character, and by the very active and efficient exertions that he made, in concentrating what forces remained, and in preparing for a renewal of the contest. The first great battle was fought at Wilton. This was within a month of his accession to the throne. The battle was very obstinately fought. At the first onset, Alfred's troops carried all before them, and there was every prospect that he would win the day. In the end, however, the tide of victory turned in favor of the Danes, and Alfred and his troops were driven from the field. There was an immense loss on both sides. In fact, both armies were, for the time, pretty effectually disabled, and each seems to have shrunk from a renewal of the contest. Instead, therefore, of fighting again, the two commanders entered into negotiations. Hubba was the name of the Danish chieftain. In the end, he made a treaty with Alfred, by which he agreed to retire from Alfred's dominions, and leave him in peace, provided that Alfred would not interfere with him in his wars in any other part of England. Alfred's kingdom was Wessex. Besides Wessex, there was Essex, Mercia, and Northumberland. Hubba and his Danes, finding that Alfred was likely to prove too formidable an antagonist for them to easily subdue, thought it would be most prudent to give up one kingdom out of the four, on conditions of not having Alfred to contend in their depredations upon the other three. They accordingly made the treaty, and the Danes withdrew. They evacuated their posts and strongholds in Wessex, and went down the Thames to London, which was in Mercia, and there commenced the new course of conquest and plunder, where they had no such powerful foe to oppose them. Buthred was the king of Mercia. He could not resist Hubba and his Danes alone, and he could not now have Alfred's assistance. Alfred was censored very much at the time, and had been condemned often since, for having thus made a separate peace for himself and his own immediate dominions, and abandoned his natural allies and friends, the people of the other Saxon kingdoms. To make a peace with savage and relentless pagans, on the express condition of leaving his fellow Christian neighbors at their mercy, has been considered eugenerous, at least, if it was not unjust. On the other hand, those who vindicate his conduct maintain that it was his duty to secure the peace and welfare of his own realm, leaving other sovereigns to take care of theirs, and that he would have done very wrong to sacrifice the property and lives of his own immediate subjects to a mere point of honor when it was utterly out of his power to protect them and his neighbors too. However this may be, Buthred, finding he could not have Alfred's aid, and that he could not protect his kingdom by any force which he could himself bring into the field, tried negotiations too, and he succeeded in buying off the Danes with money. He paid them a large sum, on condition of their leaving his dominions finally and forever, and not coming to molest him any more. Such a measure as this is always a very desperate and hopeless one. Buying off robbers or beggars or false accusers or oppressors of any kind is only to encourage them to come again, after a brief interval, under some frivolous pretext, with fresh demands or new oppressions, that they may be bought off again with higher pay. At least Buthred found it so in this case. Hubba went northward for a time into the kingdom of Northumberland, and, after various conquests and plunderings there, he came back again into Mercia, on the plea that there was a scarcity of provisions in the northern kingdom, and he was obliged to come back. Buthred bought him off again with a larger sum of money. Hubba scarcely left a kingdom this time, but spent the money with his army, in carousing and excesses, and then went to robbing and plundering as before. Buthred, at last, reduced to despair, and seeing no hope of escape from the terrible pest with which his kingdom was infested, abandoned the country and escaped to Rome. 
and received him as an exiled monarch. In the Saxon school, where he soon after died, a prey to grief and despair. The Danes overturned what remained of Buthred's government. They destroyed a famous mausoleum, the ancient burial place of the Mercian kings. This devastation of the abodes of the dead was a sort of recreation, a savage amusement, to vary the more serious and dangerous excitements attending their contests with the living. They found an officer of Buthred's government named Caolwulf, who, though a Saxon, was willing, through his love of place and power, to accept the office of king in subordination to the Danes, and hold it at their disposal, paying an annual tribute to them. Caolwulf was execrated by his countrymen, who considered him a traitor. He, in his turn, oppressed and tyrannized over them. In the meantime, a new leader, with a fresh horde of Danes, had landed in England. His name was Halfden. Halfden came with a considerable fleet of ships, and, after landing his men and performing various exploits and encountering various adventures in other parts of England, he began to turn his thoughts towards Alfred's dominions. Alfred did not pay particular attention to Halfden's movement at first, as he supposed that his treaty with Hubba had bound the whole nation of the Danes not to encroach upon his realm, whatever they might do in respect to the other Saxon kingdoms. Alfred had a famous castle at Wareham, on the southern coast of the island. It was situated on a bay which lies in what is now Dorsetshire. The castle was the strongest place in his dominions. It was garrisoned and guarded, but not with any special vigilance, as no one expected an attack upon it. Halfden brought his fleet to the southern shore of the island, and, organizing an expedition there, he put to sea, and before any one suspected his design, he entered the bay, surprised and attacked Wareham Castle, and took it. Alfred and the people of his realm were not only astonished and alarmed at the loss of the castle, but they were filled with indignation at the treachery of the Danes in violating their treaty by attacking it. Halfden said, however, that he was an independent chieftain, acting in his own name, and was not bound at all by any obligations entered into by Hubba. There followed after this a series of contests and truces, during which treacherous wars alternated with still more treacherous and elusive periods of peace, neither party on the whole gaining any decided victory. The Danes at one time, after agreeing upon a cessation of hostility, suddenly fell upon a large squadron of Alfred's horse, who, relying on the truce, were moved across the country too much off their guard. The Danes dismounted and drove off the men, and seized the horses, and thus provided themselves with cavalry, a species of force which is obvious they could not easily bring, and any ships which they could construct across the German Ocean. Without waiting for Alfred to recover from the surprise and consternation which this unexpected treachery occasioned, the newly mounted troop of Danes rode rapidly along the southern coast of England, till they came to the town of Exeter. Its name was in those days Exancester. It was then, as it is now, a very important town. It has since acquired a mournful celebrity as a place of refuge, and the scene of suffering of Queen Henrietta Maria, the mother of Charles the Second. The loss of this place was a new and heavy cloud over Alfred's prospects. It placed the whole southern coast of his realm in the hands of his enemies, and seemed to portray for the whole interior of the country a period of hopeless and intermediable calamity. It seems, too, from various unequivocal statements and allusions contained in the narratives of the times, that Alfred did not possess, during the period of his reign, the respect and affection of his subjects. He is accused, or rather, not directly accused, but spoken of as a generally known to be a guilty of many faults which alienated the hearts of his countrymen from him, and prepared them to consider his calamities as the judgments of heaven. He was young and ardent, full of youthful impetuosity and fire, and was elated at his elevation to the throne, and during the period while the Danes left him in peace, under the treaties he had made with Hubba, he gave himself up to pleasure, and not always to innocent pleasure. They charged him, too, with being tyrannical and oppressive in his government, being so devoted to gratifying his own ambition and love of personal indulgence, that he neglected his government, sacrificed the interests and the welfare of his subjects, 
had exercised his regal powers in a very despotic and arbitrary manner. It is very difficult to decide, at this late day, how far the disposition to find fault with Alfred's early administration of his government arose from, or was aggravated by, the misfortunes and calamities which befell him. On the one hand, it would not be surprising if, young and arduous and impetuous as he was at this period in his life, he should have fallen into the errors and faults which youthful monarchs are very prone to commit on being suddenly raised to power. But then, on the other hand, men are prone in all ages of the world, and most especially in such rude and uncultivated times as these were, to judge military and governmental action by the sole criterion of success. Thus, when they found that Alfred's measures, one after another, failed in protecting his country, that the impending calamities burst successively upon them, notwithstanding all Alfred's efforts to avert them. It was natural that they should look at and exaggerate his faults, and charge all their national misfortunes to the influence of them. There was a certain Saint Neot, a kinsman and religious counselor of Alfred, the history of whose life was afterward written by the abbot of Crowland, the monastery whose destruction by the Danes was described in a former chapter. In this narrative, it is said that Neot often rebuked Alfred in the severest terms for his sinful course of life, predicting the most fatal consequences if he did not reform, and using language which only a very culpable degree of remissness and irregularity could justify. You glory, said he, one day, when addressing the king, in your pride and power, and are determined and obdurate in your iniquity, but there is a terrible retribution in store for you. I entreat you to listen to my counsels, amend your life, and govern your people with moderation and justice, instead of tyranny and oppression, and thus avert, if you can, before it is too late, the impending judgments of heaven. Such language as this is obvious that only a very serious dereliction of duty on Alfred's part could call for or justify. But, whatever he may have done to deserve it, his offenses were so fully expiated by his subsequent sufferings, and he atoned for them so nobly too by the wisdom, the prudence, the faithful and devoted patriotism of his later career, that mankind have been disposed to pass by the faults of his early years without attempting to scrutinize them too closely. The noblest human spirits are always, in some periods of their existence, or in some aspects of their characters, strangely weakened by the infirmities and frailties, and deformed by sin. This is human nature. We like to imagine that we find exceptions, and to see specimens of moral perfection in our friends, or in the historical characters whose general course of action we admire. But there are no exceptions. To err and to sin, at some times and in some ways, is the common, universal, and inevitable lot of humanity. At the time when Halfden and his followers seized Wareham Castle and Exeter, Alfred had been several years upon the throne, during which time these derelictions from duty took place, so far as they existed at all, but now, alarmed at the imminence of impending danger, which threatened not only the welfare of his people, but his own kingdom, and even his life. For one Saxon monarch had been driven from his dominions, as we have seen, and had died a miserable exile at Rome. Alfred aroused himself in earnest to the work of regaining his lost influence among his people, and recovering their alienated affections. He accordingly, as his first step, convened a great assembly of the leading chieftains and noblemen of the realm, and made addresses to them, in which he urged upon them the imminence of the danger, which threatened their common country and pressed them to unite vigorously and energetically with him to contend against their common foe. They must make great sacrifices, he said, both of their comfort and ease, as well as their wealth, to resist successfully so imminent a danger. He summoned them to arms and urged them to contribute the means necessary to pay the expense of a vigorous prosecution of the war. These harangues, and the ardor and determination which Alfred manifested himself at the time of making them, were successful. 
the nation aroused itself to new exertions, and for a time there was a prospect that the country would be saved. Among the other measures to which Alfred resorted in this emergency was the attempt to encounter the Danes upon their own element, by building and equipping a fleet of ships, with which to proceed to sea, in order to meet and attack upon the water certain new bodies of invaders, who were on their way to join the Danes already on the island, coming, as a rumor said, along the southern shore. In attempting to build up a naval power, the greatest difficulty always is to provide seamen. It is much easier to build ships than to train sailors. To man his little fleet, Alfred had to enlist such half-savage foreigners as could be found in the ports, and even pirates, as was said, whom he induced to enter his service, promising them pay and such plunder as they could take from the enemy. These attempts of Alfred to build and man a fleet are considered the first rude beginnings from which the present vast edifice of British naval power took its origin. When the fleet was ready to put the sea, the people thronged the shores, watching its movements with the utmost curiosity and interest, earnestly hoping that it might be successful in its contest with the more tried and experienced armaments with which it would have to contend. Alfred was, in fact, successful in the first enterprises which he undertook with his ships. He encountered a fleet of the Danish ships in the channel and defeated them. His fleet captured, moreover, one of the largest of the vessels of the enemy and, with what would be thought in our day, unpardonable cruelty, they threw the sailors and soldiers whom they found on board into the sea and kept the vessel. After all, however, Alfred gained no conclusive and decisive victory over his foes. They were too numerous, too scattered, and too firmly seated in the various districts of the island, of some of which they had been in possession for many years. Time passed on, battles were fought, treaties of peace were made, oaths were taken, hostages were exchanged, and then, after a very brief interval of repose, hostilities would break out again, each party bitterly accusing the other of treachery. Then the poor hostages would be slain, first by one party, and afterward in retaliation by the other. In one of these temporary and elusive pacifications, Alfred attempted to bind the Danes by Christian oaths. Their customary mode of binding themselves, in cases where they wished to impose a solemn religious obligation, was to swear by a certain ornament which they wore upon their arms, which is called in the chronicles of those times a bracelet. What its form and fashion was, we can not now precisely know, but it is plain that they attached some superstitious and perhaps idolatrous associations of sacredness to it. To swear by this bracelet was to place themselves under the most solemn obligation that they could assume. Alfred, however, not satisfied with this pagan sanction, made them, in confirming one treaty, swear by the Christian relics, which were certain supposed memorials of our Savior's crucifixion, or portions of the bodies of dead saints miraculously preserved, and to which the credulous Christians of the day attached an idea of sacredness and awe, scarcely less superstitious than that which their pagan enemies felt for the bracelets on their arms. Alfred could not have supposed that these treacherous coventers since they would readily violate the faith plighted in the name of what they revered, could be held by what they hated and despised. Perhaps he thought that, though they would be no more likely to keep the new oath than the old, still, that their violation of it, when it occurred, would be in itself a great crime, that his cause would be subsequently strengthened by their thus incurring the special and unmitigated displeasure of heaven. Among the Danish chieftains, with whom Alfred had thus continually to contend in this early part of his reign, there was one very famous hero, whose name was Rollo. He invaded England with a wild horde, which attended him for a short time. But he soon retired and went to France, where he afterward greatly distinguished himself by his prowess and his exploits. The Saxon historians say that he retreated from England because Alfred gave him such a reception that he saw that it would be impossible for him to maintain his footing there. His account of it was that, 
One day, when he was perplexed with doubt and uncertainty about his plans, he fell asleep and dreamed that he saw a swarm of bees flying southward. This was an omen, and he regarded it indicating the course which he ought to pursue. He accordingly embarked his men on board his ships again, and crossed the channel, and sought successfully in Normandy, a province in France, the kingdom and the home which, either on account of Alfred or of the bees, he was not to enjoy in England. The cases, however, in which the Danish chieftains were either entirely conquered or finally expelled from the kingdom were very few. As years passed on, Alfred found his army diminishing and the strength of his kingdom wasting away. His resources were exhausted, his friends had disappeared, his towns and castles were taken, and, at last, about eight years after his coronation at Winchester as monarch of the most powerful of the Saxon kingdoms, he found himself reduced to the very last extreme of destitution and distress. End of chapter 7 Recording by Ryan Cherry. Chapter 8 of King Alfred of England by Jacob Abbott. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ryan Cherry. King Alfred of England by Jacob Abbott. Chapter 8 The Seclusion. Notwithstanding the tide of disaster and calamity which seemed to be gradually overwhelming Alfred's kingdom, he was not reduced to absolute despair, but continued for a long time the almost hopeless struggle. There is a certain desperation to which men are often aroused in the last extremity, which surpasses courage, and is even sometimes a very effectual substitute for strength, and Alfred might, perhaps, have succeeded. After all, in saving his affairs from utter ruin, had not a new circumstance intervened, which seemed at once to extinguish all remaining hope and to seal his doom. This circumstance was the arrival of a new band of Danes, who were, it seems, more numerous, more ferocious, and more insatiable than any who had come before them. The other kingdoms of the Saxons had been already pretty effectually plundered, Alfred's kingdom of Wessex was now, therefore, the most inviting field, and, after various excursions of conquest and plunder in other parts of the island, they came like an inundation over Alfred's frontiers, and all hope of resisting them seems to have been immediately abandoned. The Saxon armies were broken up. Alfred had lost, it appears, all influence and control over both leaders and men. The chieftains and nobles fled. Some left the country altogether, others hid themselves in the best retreats and fastnesses that they could find. Alfred himself was obliged to follow the general example. A few attendants, either more faithful than the rest, or else more distrustful of their own resources, and inclined accordingly to seek their own personal safety by adhering closely to their sovereign, followed him. These, however, one after another, gradually forsook him and, finally, the fallen and deserted monarch was left alone. In fact, it was a relief to him at last to be left alone, for they who remained around him became in the end a burden instead of affording him protection. They were too few to fight, and too many to be easily concealed. Alfred withdrew himself from them, thinking that, under the circumstances in which he was now placed, he was justified in seeking his own personal safety alone. He had a wife, whom he married when he was about twenty years old. But she was not with him now. Though she afterward joined him, she was in some other place of retreat. She could, in fact, be much more easily concealed than her husband. For the Danes, though they would undoubtedly have valued her very highly as a captive, would not search for her with the eager and persevering vigilance with which it was to be expected they would hunt for their most formidable but now discomfited and fugitive foe. Alfred, therefore, after disentangling himself from all but one or two trustworthy and faithful friends, wandered on towards the west, through forests and solitudes and wilds to get as far away as possible from the enemies who were upon his track. He arrived at last on the remote western frontiers of the kingdom, 
at a place whose name has been immortalized by its having been, for some time, the place of his retreat. It was called Athelney. Athelney was, however, scarcely deserving of a name, for it was nothing but a small spot of dry land in the midst of a morass, which, as grass would grow upon it in the openings among the trees, a simple cowherd had taken possession of and built his hut there. The solid land, which the cowherd called his farm, was only about two acres in extent. All around it was a black morass, of great extent, wooded with alders, among which green sedges grew, and sluggish streams meandered, and mossy tracts of verdure spread treacherously over deep bogs and sloughs. In the driest season of the summer, the goats and the sheep penetrated into these recesses, but, excepting in the devious and torturous path by which the cowherd found his way to his island, it was almost impassable for man. Alfred, however, attracted now by the impediments and obstacles which would have repelled a wanderer under any other circumstances, went on with the greater alacrity, the more intricate and entangled the thickets of the morass were found, since these difficulties promised to impede or deter pursuit. He found his way into the cowherd's hut. He asked for shelter. People who live in solitudes are always hospitable. The cowherd took the wayworn fugitive in, and gave him food and shelter. Alfred remained his guest for a considerable time. The story is that after a few days, the cowherd asked him who he was, and how he came to be wandering about in that distressed and destitute condition. Alfred told him that he was one of the king's thanes. A thane was a sort of chieftain in the Saxon state. He accounted for his condition by saying that Alfred's army had been beaten by the Danes, and that he, with the other generals, had been forced to fly. He begged the cowherd to conceal him, and to keep the secret of his character until time should change, so that he could take the field again. The story of Alfred's seclusion on the island, as it might almost be called, of Ethelney, is told very differently by the different narrators of it. Some of these narrations are inconsistent and contradictory. They all combine, however, though they differ in respect to many other incidents and details in relating the far-famed story of Alfred's leaving the cakes to burn. It seems that, though the cowherd himself was allowed to regard Alfred as a man of rank in disguise, even though he did not know that it was the king, his wife was not admitted even in this partial way, into the secret. She was made to consider the stranger as some common strolling countryman, and the better to sustain this idea, he was taken into the cowherd's service, and employed in various ways from time to time, in labors about the house and farm. Alfred's thoughts, however, were little interested in these occupations. His mind dwelt incessantly upon his misfortunes and the calamities which had befallen his kingdom. He was harassed by continual suspense and anxiety, not being able to gain any clear or certain intelligence about the condition and movements of either his friends or foes. He was revolving continually vague and half-formed plans for resuming the command of his army, and attempting to regain his kingdom, and wearying himself with fruitless attempts to devise means to accomplish these ends. Whenever he engaged voluntarily in any occupation, it would always be something in harmony with these trains of thought, and these plans. He would repair and put in order implements of hunting, or anything else which might be deemed to have some relation to war. He would make bows and arrows in the chimney corner, lost all the time in melancholy reveries, or in wild and visionary schemes of future exploits. One evening, while he was thus at work, the cowherd's wife left, for a few moments, some cakes under his charge, which she was baking upon the great stone hearth, in preparation for their common supper. Alfred, as might have been expected, let the cakes burn. The woman, when she came back and found them smoking, was very angry. She told him that he could eat the cakes fast enough when they were baked, though it seemed he was too lazy and good for nothing to do the least thing in helping to bake them. What widespread and lasting effects result sometimes from the most trifling and inadequate causes, 
The singularity of such an adventure befalling a monarch in disguise, and the terse antithesis of the reproaches with which the woman rebuked him, invest this incident with an interest which carries it everywhere, spontaneously among mankind. Millions, within the last thousand years, have heard the name of Alfred, who have known no more of him than this story, and millions more, who never would have heard of him but for the story, have been led by it to study the whole history of his life, so that the unconscious cowherd's wife, in scolding the disguised monarch for forgetting her cakes, was perhaps doing more than he ever did himself for the wide extension of his future fame. Alfred was, for a time, extremely depressed and disheartened by the sense of his misfortunes and calamities, but the monkish writers who described his character and his life say that the influence of his sufferings was extremely salutary in softening his disposition and improving his character. He had been proud and haughty and domineering before. He became humble, docile, and considerate now. Faults of character that are superficial, resulting from the force of circumstances and peculiarities of temptation, rather than from innate depravity of heart, are easily and readily burned off in the fire of affliction, while the same severe ordeal seems only to indurate the most hopelessly those propensities which lie deeply seated in an inherent and radical perversity. Alfred, though restless and wretched in his apparently hopeless seclusion, bore his privations with great degree of patience and fortitude, planning all the time the best means of reorganizing his scattered forces and of rescuing his country from the ruin into which it had fallen. Some of his former friends, roaming as he himself had done as fugitives around the country, happened at length to come into the neighborhood of his retreat. He heard of them, and cautiously made himself known. They were rejoiced to find their old commander once more, and, as there was no force of the Danes in that neighborhood at the time, they lingered timidly and fearlessly at first in the vicinity until at length, growing more bold as they found themselves unmolested in their retreat, they began to make it their gathering place and the headquarters. Alfred threw off his disguise and assumed his true character. Tidings of his having been thus discovered spread confidentially among the most tried and faithful of his Saxon followers, who had themselves been seeking safety in other places of refuge. They began at first cautiously and by stealth, but afterward more openly to repair to the spot. Alfred's family, too, from which he had now been for many months entirely separated, contrived to rejoin him. The herdsman, who proved to be a man of intelligence and character, superior to his station, entered heartily into all these movements. He kept the secret faithfully. He did all in his power to provide for the wants and to promote the comfort of his warlike guests and, by his fidelity and devotion, laid Alfred under obligations of gratitude to him, which the king, when he was afterward restored to the throne, did not forget to repay. Notwithstanding, however, all the efforts which the herdsmen made to obtain supplies, the company now assembled at Ethelney were sometimes reduced to great straits. There were not only the wants of Alfred and his immediate family and attendants to be provided for, but many persons were continually coming and going, arriving often at unexpected times, and acting as roving and disorganized bodies of soldiers are, very apt to do at such times, in a very inconsiderate manner. The herdsman's farm produced very little food, and the inaccessibilities of the situation made it difficult to bring in supplies from without. In fact, it was necessary, in one part of the approach to it, to use a boat, so that the place is generally called, in history, an island. Though it was insulated mainly by swamps and morasses rather than by navigable waters, there were, however, sluggish streams all around it, where Alfred's men, when their stores were exhausted, went to fish under the herdsman's guidance, returning sometimes with a moderate fare, and sometimes with none. The monks who describe this portion of Alfred's life have recorded an incident as having occurred on the occasion of one of these fishing excursions, which, however, is certainly in part a fabrication, and may be wholly so, 
It was in the winter. The waters about the grounds were frozen up. The provisions in the house were nearly exhausted, there being scarcely anything remaining. The men went away with their fishing apparatuses and with their bows and arrows, in hopes of procuring some fish or fowl to replenish their stores. Alfred was left alone, with only a single lady of his family, who was called, in the account, Mother, though it could not have been Alfred's own mother, as she had been dead many years. Alfred was sitting in the hut reading. A beggar, who had by some means or other found his way in over the frozen morasses, came to the door and asked for food. Alfred, looking up from his book, asked the mother, whoever she was, to go and see what there was to give him. She went to make an examination, and presently returned, saying that there was nothing to give him. There was only a single loaf of bread remaining, and that would not be half enough for their own wants that very night when the hunting party should return, if they should come back unsuccessful from their expedition. Alfred hesitated a moment, and then ordered half the loaf to be given to the beggar. He said, in justification of the act, that this trust was now in God, and that the power which once, with five loaves and two small fishes, fed abundantly three thousand men, could easily make half a loaf suffice for them. The loaf was accordingly divided, the beggar was supplied, and, delighted with this unexpected relief, he went away. Alfred turned his attention again to the reading. After a time, the book dropped from his hand. He had fallen asleep. He dreamed that a certain saint appeared to him, and made a revelation to him from heaven. God said he heard his prayers, was satisfied with his penitence, and pitied his sorrows, and that in his act of charity in relieving the poor beggar, even at the risk of leaving himself and his friends in utter destitution, was extremely acceptable in the sight of heaven. The faith and trust which he thus manifested were about to be rewarded. The time for a change had come. He was to be restored to his kingdom, and raised to a new and higher state of prosperity and power than before. As a token that this prediction was true, and would be all fulfilled, the hunting party would return that night with an ample and abundant supply. Alfred awoke from his sleep with his mind filled with new hopes and anticipations. The hunting party returned loaded with supplies, and, in a state of the greatest exhilaration at their success, they had fish and game enough to have supplied a little army. The incident of relieving the beggar, the dream, and their unwanted success confirming it, inspired them all with confidence and hope. They began to form plans for commencing offensive operations. They would build fortifications to strengthen their position on the island. They would collect a force. They would make sallies to attack the smaller parties of the Danes. They would send agents and emissaries about the kingdom to arouse and encourage and assemble such Saxon forces as were yet to be found. In a word, they would commence a series of measures for recovering the country from the possession of its pestilent enemy, and for restoring the rightful sovereign to the throne. The development of these projects and plans, and the measures for carrying them into effect, were very much hastened by an event which suddenly occurred in the neighborhood of Ethelney, the account of which, however, must be postponed to the next chapter. End of chapter 8 Recording by Ryan Cherry Chapter 9 of King Alfred of England This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. King Alfred of England by Jacob Abbott Chapter 9 Reassembling of the Army Ethelney, though its precise locality could not now be certainly ascertained, was in the southwestern part of England, in Somersetshire, which county lies in the southern shore of the Bristol Channel. There is a region of marshes in that vicinity, which tradition assigns as the place of Alfred's retreat, and there was, about the middle of this century, a farmhouse there, which bore the name of Ethelney, though its name may have been given to it in modern times by those who imagined it to be the ancient locality. A jewel of gold, engraved as an amulet to be worn about the neck, and inscribed with the Saxon words which mean, Alfred had me made, was found in the vicinity and is still carefully preserved in the museum in England. Some curious antiquarians profess to find the very hillock, rising out of the low grounds around, 
where the herdsmen that entertained Alfred so long lived. But this, of course, is all uncertain. The peculiarities of the spot derived their character from the morasses in the woods and the courses of the sluggish streams in the neighborhood. And these are elements of a landscape scenery which ten centuries of time and of cultivation would entirely change. Whatever may have been the precise situation of the spot, instead of being, as at first, a mere hiding place and retreat, it became, before many months, as was intimated in the last chapter, a military camp. Secluded and concealed, it is true, but still possessing, in a considerable degree, the characteristics of a fastness and a place of defense. Alfred's company erected something which might be called a wall. They built a bridge across the water where the herdsman's boat had been accustomed to ply. They raised two towers to watch and guard the bridge. All these defenses were, indeed, of a very rude and simple construction. Still, they answered the purpose intended. They afforded a real protection, and, more than all, they produced a certain moral effect upon the minds of those whom they shielded, by enabling them to consider themselves as no longer lurking fugitives, dependent for safety on simple concealment, but as a garrison, weak it is true, but still gathering strength, and advancing gradually toward a condition which would enable them to make a positive aggression upon the enemy. The circumstance which occurred to hasten the development of Alfred's plans, and which was briefly alluded to at the close of the last chapter, was the following. It seems that quite a large party of Danes, under the command of a leader named Hubba, had been making a tour of conquest and plunder in Wales, which country was on the other side of the Bristol Channel, directly north of Ethelney, where Alfred was beginning to concentrate a force. He would be immediately exposed to an attack from this quarter, as soon as it should be known that he was at Ethelney. As the distance across the channel was not great, and the Danes were provided with shipping, Ethelney was in the country called Somersetshire, to the southwest of Somersetshire, a little below it, on the shores of the Bristol Channel, was a castle, called Castle Kenwith, in Devonshire. The Duke of Devonshire, who held this castle, encouraged by Alfred's preparations for action, had assembled a considerable force here, to be ready to cooperate with Alfred in the active measures which he was about to adopt. Things being in this state, Hubba brought down his forces to the northern shores of the channel, collected together all the boats and shipping that he could command, crossed the channel, and landed on Devonshire shore. Odun, the duke, not being strong enough to resist, fled and shut himself up with all his men in the castle. Hubba advanced to the castle walls, and, sitting down before them, began to consider what to do. Hubba was the last surviving son of Ragnar Lodbrog whose deeds and adventures were related in the former chapter. He was, like all the other chieftains among the Danes, a man of great determination and energy, and he made himself very celebrated all over the land by his exploits and conquests. His particular horde of marauders, too, were specially celebrated among all the others, on account of a mysterious and magical banner which they bore. The name of the banner was the Refan, that is, the Raven. There was the figure of a raven woven or embroidered on the banner. Hubba's three sisters had woven it for their brothers, when they went forth across the German Ocean to avenge their father's death. It possessed, as both the Danes and Saxons believed, supernatural and magical powers. The raven on the banner could foresee the result of any battle into which it was born. It remained lifeless and at rest whenever the result was to be adverse, and on the other hand, it fluttered its wings with a mysterious and magical vitality when they who bore it were destined to victory. The Danes consequently looked up to the banner with a feeling of profound veneration and awe, and the Saxons feared and dreaded its mysterious power. The explanation of this pretended miracle is easy. The imagination of superstitious men, in such a state of society as that of these half-savage Danes, is capable of much greater triumphs over the reason and the senses than is implied in making them believe that the wings of a bird are either in motion or at rest, whichever it fancies, when the banner on which the image is embroidered is advancing to the field and fluttering in the breeze. The castle of Kenwith was situated on a rocky promontory, and was defended by a Saxon wall. Hubba saw that it would be difficult to carry it by a direct assault. On the other hand, it was not well supplied with water or provisions, and the numerous multitude 
which had crowded into it, would, if of a thought, be speedily compelled to surrender by thirst and famine, if he were simply to wait a short time, till their scanty stock of food was consumed. Perhaps the raven did not flutter her wings when Hubba approached the castle, but by her apparent lifelessness portended calamity if an attack were to be made. At all events, Hubba decided not to attack the castle, but to invest it closely on all sides with his army on the land and with his vessels on the side of the sea, and thus reduce it by famine. He accordingly stationed his troops and his galleys at their posts, and established himself in his tent, quietly to await the result. He did not have to wait so long as he anticipated. Odun, finding that his danger was so imminent, nay, that his destruction was inevitable if he remained in his castle, thus shut in, determined in the desperation to which the emergency reduced him, to make a sally. Accordingly, one night, as soon as it was dark, so that the indications of any movement within the castle might not be perceived by the sentinels and watchmen in Hubba's lines, he began to marshal and organize his army for a sudden and furious onset upon the camp of the Danes. They waited, when all was ready, till the first break of day, to make the surprise most effectual. It was necessary that it should take place in the night, but then, on the other hand, the success, if they should be successful, would require, in order to be followed up with advantage, the light of day. Odun chose, therefore, the earliest dawn as the time for his attempt, as this was the only period which would give him at first darkness for his surprise, and afterward light for his victory. The time was well chosen. The arrangements were all well made, and the result corresponded with the character of the preparations. The sally was triumphantly successful. The Danes, who were all, except their sentinels, sleeping quietly and secure, were suddenly aroused by the unearthly and terrific yells with which the Saxons burst onto the lines of their encampment. They flew to arms, but the shock of the onset produced a panic and confusion, which soon made their cause hopeless. Odun and his immediate followers pressed directly forward into Hubba's tent, where they surprised the commander, and massacred him on the spot. They seized, too, to their inexpressible joy, the sacred banner which was in Hubba's tent, and bore it forth, rejoicing in it not merely as a splendid trophy of their victory, but as a loss to their enemies which fixed and sealed their doom. The Danes fled before their enemies in terror, and the consternation which they felt when they learned that their banner had been captured, and their leader slain, was soon changed into absolute despair. The Saxons slew them without mercy, cutting down some as they were running before them in their headlong flight, and transfixing others with their spears and arrows as they lay upon the ground, trampled down by the crowds in the confusion. There was no place or refuge of which they could fly except to their ships. Those, therefore, that escaped the weapons of their pursuers, fled in the direction of the water, where the strong and fortunate gained the boats and the galleys, while the exhausted and the wounded were drowned. The fleet sailed away from the coast, and the Saxons, on surveying the scene of the terrible contest, estimated that there were twelve hundred dead bodies lying in the field. This victory, and especially the capture of the raven, produced vast effects on the minds of both the Saxons and of the Danes, animating and encouraging the one, and depressing the other with superstitions, as well as natural and proper fears. The influence of the battle was sufficient, in fact, wholly to change Alfred's position and prospects, the news of the discovery of the place of his retreat, and of the measures which he was maturing for taking the field again to meet his enemies, spread throughout the country. The people were everywhere ready to take up arms and join him. There were large bodies of Danes in several parts of his dominion still, and they alarmed somewhat at these indications of new efforts of resistance on the part of their enemies, began to concentrate their strength, and prepare for another struggle. The main body of the Danes were encamped at a place called Edendun, in Wiltshire. There is a hill near, which the army made their main position, and the marks of their fortifications have been traced there, either in imagination or reality in modern times. Alfred wished to gain more precise and accurate information than he yet possessed of the numbers and situation of his foes, and, in order to do this, instead of employing a spy, he conceived the design of going himself in disguise to explore the camp of the Danes. The undertaking was full of danger, but yet not quite so desperate as it first might seem. Alfred had had abundant opportunities during the months of his seclusion to become familiar with the modes of speech and the manners of peasant life. He had also, in his early years, 
stored his memory with Saxon poetry, as has already been stated. He was fond of music, too, and well skilled in it, so that he had every qualification for assuming the character of one of those roving harpers who, in those days, followed armies to sing songs and make amusement for the soldiers. He determined, consequently, to assume the disguise of a harper and to wander into the camp of the Danes, that he might make his own observations on the nature and magnitude of the force with which he was about to contend. He accordingly clothed himself in the garb of the character which he was to assume, and, taking his harp upon his shoulder, wandered away in the direction of the Northmen's camp. Such a strolling countryman, half musician, half beggar, would enter without suspicion or hindrance into the camp, even though he belonged to the nation of the enemy. Alfred was readily admitted, and he wandered at will about the lines to play and sing to the soldiers wherever he found groups to listen, intent, apparently, on nothing but his scanty pittance of pay, while he was really studying with the utmost attention and care the number and disposition and discipline of the troops and all the arrangements of the army. He came very near discovering himself, however, by overacting his part. His music was so well executed, and his ballads were so fine, that reports of the excellence of his performance reached the commander's ears. He ordered the pretended harper to be sent into his tent, that he might hear him play and sing. Alfred went, and thus he had the opportunity of completing his observations in the tent, and in the presence of the Danish king. Alfred found that the Danish camp was in a very unguarded and careless condition. The name of the commander, or king, was Gunthrum. Alfred, while playing in his presence, studied his character, and it is not improbable that the very extraordinary course which he afterward pursued in respect to Gunthrum may have been caused, in a great degree, by the opportunity he now enjoyed of domestic access to him and of obtaining a near and intimate view of his social and personal character. Gunthrum treated the supposed harper with great kindness. He was much pleased both with his singing and his songs, being attracted to probably in some degree by a certain mysterious interest which the humble stranger must have inspired, for Alfred possessed a personal and intellectual traits of character which could not but have given to his conversation and his manners a certain charm, notwithstanding all his efforts to disguise or conceal them. However this may be, Gunthrum gave Alfred a very friendly reception, and the hour of social intercourse and enjoyment which the general and the ballad singer spent together was only a precursor of the more solid and honest friendship which afterwards subsisted between them as allied sovereigns. Alfred had one person with him, whom he had brought from Ethelney, a sort of attendant, to help him carry his harp, and to be a companion for him on the way. He would have needed such a companion even if he had only been what he seemed, but for a spy going in disguise into the camp of such ferocious enemies as the Danes, it would seem absolutely indispensable that he should have the support and sympathy of a friend. Alfred, after finishing his examination of the camp of Gunthrum, and forming secretly in his own mind his plans for attacking it, moved leisurely away, taking his harp and his attendant with him, as if going on in search of some new place to practice his profession. As soon as he was out of reach of observation, he made a circuit and returned in safety to Ethelney. The season was now spring, and everything favored the commencement of his enterprise. His first measure was to send out some trusty messengers into all the neighboring counties, to visit and confer with his friends at their various castles and strongholds. These messengers were to announce to such Saxon leaders as they should find that Alfred was still alive, and that he was preparing to take the field against the Danes again, and were to invite them to assemble at a certain place appointed, in a forest, with as many followers as they could bring, that the king might there complete the organization of the army and hold consultation with them to mature their plans. The wood on the borders of which they were to meet was an extensive forest of willows, fifteen miles long and six broad. It was known by the name of Selwood Forest. There was a celebrated place called the Stone of Egbert, where the meeting was to be held. Each chieftain whom the messenger should visit was to be invited to come to the Stone of Egbert at the appointed day, with as many armed men, and yet in as secret and noiseless a manner as possible, so as thus, while concentrating all their forces in preparation for their intended attack, to avoid everything which would tend to put Gunthrum on his guard. The messengers found the Saxon chieftains very ready to enter into Alfred's plans. They were rejoiced to hear, as some of them did now for the first time here, 
that he was alive, and that the spirit and energy of his former character were about to be exiled again. Everything, in fact, conspired to favor the enterprise. The long and gloomy months of winter were past, and the opening spring brought with it, as usual, excitement and readiness for action. The tidings of Odin's victory over Hubba, and the capture of the sacred raven, which had spread everywhere, and awakened a general enthusiasm and desire on the part of all the Saxon chieftains and soldiers to try their strength once more with their ancient enemies. Accordingly, those to whom the secret was entrusted eagerly accepted this invitation, or perhaps, as it should rather be expressed, obeyed the summons which Alfred sent them. They marshaled their forces without any delay, and repaired to the appointed place in Selwood Forest. Alfred was ready to meet them there. Two days were occupied with the arrivals of the different parties, and in the mutual congratulations and rejoicings. Growing more bold, as their sense of strength increased with their increasing numbers, and with the ardor and enthusiasm which their mutual influence on each other inspired, they spent the intervals of their consultations in festivities and rejoicings, celebrating the occasion with games and martial music. The forest resounded with the blast of horns, the sound of trumpets, the clash of arms, and the shouts of joy and congratulation which all the efforts of the more prudent and cautious could not repress. In the meantime, Guntram remained in his encampment at Edendune. This seems to have been the principal concentration of the forces of the Danes, which were marshaled for military service. And yet, there were large numbers of the people, disbanded soldiers or non-combatants, who had come over in the train of the armies, that had taken possession of the lands which they had conquered, and had settled upon them for cultivation, as if to make them their permanent home. These intruders were scattered in larger or smaller bodies in various parts of the kingdom, the Saxon inhabitants being prevented from driving them away by the influence and power of the armies, which still kept possession of the field, and preserved their military organization complete, ready for action at any time whenever any organized Saxon force should appear. Guntram, as we have said, headed the largest of the armies, he was aware of the increasing excitement which was spreading among the Saxon population, and he even heard rumors of the movements which the bodies of Saxons made in going under their several chieftains to the Selwood Forest. He expected that some important movement was about to occur, but he had no idea the preparations so extended, and for so decisive a demonstration, were so far advanced. He remained, therefore, at his camp at Edendune, gradually completing his arrangements for his summer campaign but making no preparations for resisting any sudden or violent attack. When all was ready, Alfred put himself at the head of his forces, which had collected at the Egbert Stone, or, as it is quaintly spelled in some of the old accounts, Ekberthestan. There is a place called Brixtan in that vicinity now, which may possibly be the same name modified and abridged by the lapse of time. Alfred moved forward toward Guthrum's camp, he went only part of the way the first day, intending to finish the march by getting into the immediate vicinity of the enemy on the morrow. He succeeded in accomplishing this object, and encamped the next night at a place called Eclia, on an eminence from which he could reconnoiter, from a great distance, the position of the army. That night, as he was sleeping in his tent, he had a remarkable dream. He dreamed that his relative, St. Neot, who has already been mentioned as the chaplain or priest who reproved him so severely for his sins in the early part of his reign, appeared to him. The apparition bid him not to fear the immense army of pagans whom he was going to encounter on the morrow. God, he said, had accepted his penitence, and was now about to take him under his special protection. The calamities which had befallen him were sent in judgment to punish the pride and arrogance which he had manifested in the early part of his reign. But his faults had been so expiated by the sufferings he had endured, and by the penitence and the piety which they have been the means of awakening in his heart. And now he might go forward into the battle without fear, as God was about to give him the victory over all his enemies. The king related his dream the next morning to his army. The enthusiasm and ardor which the chieftains and the men had felt before were very much increased by this assurance of success. They broke up their encampment, therefore, and commenced the march, which was to bring them, before many hours, into the presence of the enemy, with great alacrity and eager expectations of success.
End of chapter 9. Recording by Ryan Cherick. Chapter 10 of King Alfred of England. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Ryan Cherrick. King Alfred of England by Jacob Abbott. Chapter 10. The Victory Over the Danes. Encouraged by his dream, and animated by the number and the elation of his followers, Alfred led his army onward toward the part of the country where the camp of the enemy lay. He intended to surprise them, and, although Guntherm had heard vague rumors that some great Saxon movement was in train, he viewed the sudden appearance of this large and well-organized army with amazement. He had possession of the hill near Edendune, which has been already described. He had established his headquarters here, and made his strongest fortifications on the summit of the eminence. The main body of his forces were, however, encamped upon the plain over which they extended in vast numbers, far and wide. Alfred halted his men to change the order of march into the order of battle. Here he made an address to his men. As no time was to be lost, he spoke but a few words. He reminded them that they were to contend that day, to rescue themselves and their country from the intolerable oppression of a horde of pagan idolaters, that God was on their side, and had promised them victory, and he urged them to act like men, so as to deserve the success and happiness which was in store for them. The army then advanced to the attack, the Danes having been drawn out hastily, but with as much order as the suddenness of the call would allow, to meet them. When near enough for their arrows to take effect, the long line of Alfred's troop discharged their arrows. They then advanced to the attack with lances, but soon these and all other weapons which kept the combatants at a distance were thrown aside, and it became a terrible conflict with swords, man to man. It was not long before the Danes began to yield. They were not sustained by the strong assurance of victory, nor by the desperate determination which animated the Saxons. The flight soon became general. They could not gain the fortification on the hill, for Alfred had forced his way in between the encampment on the plains and the approaches to the hill. The Danes, consequently, not being able to find refuge in either part of the position they had taken, fled altogether from the field pursued by Alfred's victorious columns as fast as they could follow. Guntherm succeeded, by great and vigorous exertions, in rallying his men, or at least, in so far collecting and concentrating the separate bodies of the fugitives as to change the flight into a retreat, having some semblance of military order. Vast numbers had been left dead upon the field. Others had been taken prisoners. Others still had become hopelessly dispersed, having fled from the field in battle in diverse directions, and wandered so far in their terror that they had not been able to rejoin their leader in his retreat. Then, great numbers of those who pressed on under Guntram's command, exhausted by fatigue, or spent and fainting from their wounds, sank down by the wayside to die, while their comrades, intent only upon their own safety, pressed incessantly on. The retreating army was thus, in a short time, reduced to a small fraction of its original force, the remaining body, with Guntram at their head, continued their retreat until they reached a castle, which promised them protection. They poured in over the drawbridges and through the gates of this fortress in extreme confusion, and feeling suddenly, and for the moment, entirely relieved at their escape from the imminence of the immediate danger, they shut themselves in. The finding of such a retreat would have been great good fortune for those wretched fugitives, if there had been any large force in the country to come soon to their deliverance. But, as they were without provisions and without water, they soon began to perceive that, unless they obtained some speedy help from without, they had only escaped the Saxon lances and swords to die a ten times more bitter death of thirst and famine, and there was no force to relieve them. The army which had been thus defeated was the great central force of the Danes upon the island. The other detachments and independent bands which were scattered about the land were thunderstruck at the news of this terrible defeat. The Saxons, too, were everywhere aroused to the highest pitch of enthusiasm at the reappearance of their king, and in tidings of his victory. The whole country was in arms. Guntram, however, shut up in his castle and closely invested with Alfred's forces, had no means of knowing what was passing without. His numbers were so small in comparison with those besieging him 
that would have been madness for him to have attempted a sally, and he would not surrender. He waited day after day, hoping against hope that some succour would come. His half-famished sentinels gazed from the watchtowers of the castle all around, looking for some cloud of distant dust, or weapon glancing in the sun, which might denote the approach of friends coming to their rescue. This lasted fourteen days. At the end of that time, the number within this wretched prison who were raving in the delirium of famine and thirst, or dying in agony, became too great for Gunther to persist any longer. He surrendered. Alfred was once more in possession of his kingdom. During the fourteen days that elapsed between the victory on the field of battle and the final surrender of Gunther, Alfred, feeling that the power was now in his hands, had had ample time to reflect on the course which he should pursue with his subjugated enemies, and the result to which he came, and the measure which he adopted, events as much as any act of his life, the greatness and originality and nobleness of his character. Here were two distant and independent races on the same island, that had been engaged for many years in a most fierce and sanguinary struggle, each gaining at times a temporary and partial victory, but neither able entirely to subdue or exterminate the other. The Danes, it is true, might be considered as the aggressors in this contest, and, as such, wholly in the wrong. But then, on the other hand, it was to be remembered that the ancestors of the Saxons had been guilty of precisely the same aggressions upon the Britons, who held the island before them, so that the Danes were, after all, only intruding upon intruders. It was, besides, the general maxim of the age that the territories of the world were prizes open for competition, and that the right to possess and to govern vested naturally and justly in those who could show themselves the strongest. Then, moreover, the Danes had been now for many years in Britain, Vast numbers had quietly settled on agricultural lands. They had become peaceful inhabitants. They had established, in many cases, friendly relations with the Saxons. They had intermarried with them, and the two races, instead of appearing as at first, simply as two hostile armies of combatants contending on the field, had been for some years acquiring the character of a mixed population, established and settled, though heterogeneous and, in some sense, antagonistic still. To root out all these people, intruders though they were, and send them back again across the German Ocean, to regions where they no longer had friends or home, would have been a desperate, in fact, an impossible undertaking. Alfred saw all these things. He took, in fact, a general and comprehensive and impartial view of the whole subject, instead of regarding it, as most conquerors in his situation would have done, in a partisan, that is, an exclusively Saxon point of view. He saw how impossible it was to undo what had been done, and wisely determined to take things as they were, and to make the best of the present situation of affairs, leaving the past, and aiming only at accomplishing the best that was now attainable for the future. It would be well if all men who are engaged in quarrels which they vainly endeavor to settle by discussing and disputing about what is past and gone, and can now never be recalled, would follow his example. In all such cases, we should say, let the past be forgotten, and, taking things as they now are, let us see what we can do to secure peace and happiness in the future. The policy which Alfred determined to adopt was, not to attempt the utter extirpation of the Danes from England, but only to expel the armed forces from his own dominions allowing those peacefully disposed to remain in quiet possession of such lands in other parts of the island as they had already occupied. Instead, therefore, of treating Guntram with harshness and severity as a captive enemy, he told him that he was willing not only to give him his liberty, but to regard him on certain conditions as a friend and ally, and allow him to reign as a king over that part of England which his countrymen possessed and which was beyond Alfred's own frontiers. These conditions were that Guntram was to go away with all his forces and followers out of Alfred's kingdom, under solemn oaths never to return, that he was to confine himself thenceforth to the southeastern part of England, a territory from which the Saxon government had long disappeared, that he was to give hostages for the faithful fulfillment of these stipulations 
without, however, receiving on his part any hostages from Alfred. There was one other stipulation, more extraordinary than all the rest. Viz, that Guntram should become a convert to Christianity, and publicly avow his adhesion to the Saxon faith by being baptized in the presence of the leaders of both armies, in the most open and solemn manner. In this proposed baptism, Alfred himself would stand his godfather. This idea of winning over a pagan soldier to the Christian church as the price of his ransom from famine and death in the castle to which his direst enemy had driven him, this enemy himself, the instrument thus of so rude a mode of conversion, to be the sponsor of a new communicant's religion's profession, was one in keeping, it is true, with the spirit of the times. But still it is one which, under the circumstances of this case, only a mind of great originality and power would have conceived of or attempted to carry into effect. Guntram might well be astonished at this unexpected turn in his affairs. A few days before, he saw himself on the brink of utter and absolute destruction, shut up with his famous soldiers in a gloomy castle, with the enemy, bitter and implacable, as he supposed, thundering at the gates. The only alternatives before him seemed to be to die of starvation, and frenzy within the walls which covered him, or by a cruel military execution in the event of surrender. He surrendered at last, as it would seem, only because the utmost that human cruelty can inflict is more tolerable than the horrid agonies of thirst and hunger. We cannot but hope that Alfred was led, in some degree, by a generous principle of Christian forgiveness in proposing these terms which he did to his fallen enemy, and also that Guntram, in accepting them, was influenced in part at least by emotions of gratitude and by admiration of the high example of Christian virtue which Alfred thus exhibited. At any rate, he did accept them. The army of the Danes were liberated from their confinement and commenced their march to the eastward. Guntram himself, attended by thirty of his chiefs and many other followers, became Alfred's guest for some weeks, until the most pressing measures for the organization of Alfred's government could be attended to, and the necessary preparations for the baptism could be made. At length, some weeks after the surrender, the parties all repaired together, now firm friends and allies, to a place near Ethelney, where the ceremony of baptism was to be performed. The admission of this pagan chieftain into the Christian church did not probably mark any real change in his opinions on the question of paganism and Christianity, but it was not the less important in its consequences on that account. The moral effect of it upon the minds of his followers was of great value. It opened the way for their reception of the Christian faith. If any of them should be disposed to receive it, then it changed the wholly the feeling which prevailed among the Saxon soldiery, and also the Saxon chieftains, in respect to these enemies. A great deal of the bitterness of exasperation with which they had regarded them arose from the fact that they were pagans, the haters, the despisers of the rites and institutions of religion. Guntram approaching baptism was to change all this, and Alfred, in leading him to the baptismal font, was achieving, in the estimation not only of all England, but of France and Rome, a far greater and nobler victory than when he conquered his armies on the field of Edendune. The various ceremonies connected with the baptism were protracted through several days. They were commenced at a place called Aller, near Ethelney, where there was a religious establishment and priests to perform the necessary rites. The new convert was clothed in white garments, the symbol of purity, then customarily worn by candidates for baptism, and was covered with a mystic veil. They gave Guntram a new name, a Christian, that is, a Saxon name. Converted pagans received always a new name, in those days, when baptized. In our common phrase, the Christian name has arisen from the circumstance. Guntram's Christian name was Athelstan. Alfred was his godfather. After the baptism, the whole party proceeded to a town a few miles distant, which Alfred had decided to make a royal residence and there other ceremonies connected with the new convert's admission to the church were performed, the whole ending with a series of great public festivities and rejoicing. A very full and formal treaty of peace and amity was now concluded between the two sovereigns, 
for Guntram was styled in the treaty as a king, and was to hold in the dominions assigned to him, to the eastward of Alfred's realm, an independent jurisdiction. He agreed, however, by this treaty, to confine himself, from that time forward, to the limits thus assigned. If the reader wishes to see what part of England it was which Guntram was thus to hold, he can easily identify it by finding upon the map the following counties, which now occupy the same territory, viz. Norfolk, Suffolk, Cambridgeshire, Essex, and part of Herefordshire. The population of this region consisted already, in a great measure, of Danes. It was the part more easily accessible from the German Ocean by means of the Thames and the Medway, and it had, accordingly, become the chief seat of the Northmen's power. Guntram not only agreed to confine himself to the limits thus marked out, but also to consider himself henceforth as Alfred's friend and ally in the event of any new bands of adventurers arriving on the coast and to join Alfred in his endeavors to resist them. In hoping he would fulfill his obligation, Alfred did not rely altogether on Guntram's foes or promises, or even on the hostages that he held. He made it for his interest to fulfill them, by giving him peaceable possession of his territory, after having, by his victories, impressed him with a very high idea of his own great military resources and power. He had placed his conquered enemy under very strong inducements, to be satisfied with what he now possessed, and to make common cause with Alfred in resisting the encroachments of any new marauders. Guntram was therefore honestly resolved on keeping his faith with his new ally, and when all these stipulations were made, and the treaties were signed, and the ceremonies of the baptism all performed, Alfred dismissed his guest with many presents and high honors. There is some uncertainty whether Alfred did not, in addition to the other stipulations under which he bound Guntram, reserve to himself the superior sovereignty over Guntram's dominions, in such a manner that Guntram, though complimented in the treaty with the title of king, was, after all, only a sort of viceroy, holding his throne under Alfred as his liege lord. One thing is certain, that Alfred took care in his treaty with Guntram, to settle all the fundamental laws of both kingdoms, making them the same for both, as if he foresaw the complete and entire union which was to ultimately take place, and wished to facilitate the accomplishment of this end by having the political and social constitution of the two states brought at once into harmony with each other. It proved, in the end, that Guntram was faithful to his obligations and promises. He settled himself quietly in the dominions which the treaty assigned to him, and made no more attempts to encroach upon Alfred's realm. When other other parties of Danes came upon the coast, as they sometimes did, they found no favor or countenance from him. They came in some cases, expecting his cooperation and aid, but he always refused it, and by this discouragement, as well as by open resistance, he drove many bands away, turning the tide of invasion southward into France and other regions on the continent. Alfred, in the meantime, gave his whole time and attention to organizing the various departments of his government, to planning and building towns, repairing and fortifying castles, opening roads, establishing courts of justice, and arranging and settling in operation the complicated machinery necessary in the working of a well-conducted social state. The nature and operation of some of his plans will be described more fully in the next chapter. In concluding this chapter, we will add that notwithstanding his victory over Guntram, and Guntram's subsequent good faith, Alfred never enjoyed an absolute peace, but during the whole remainder of his reign was more or less molested with parties of Northmen, who came from time to time to land on English shores, and who met sometimes with partial and temporary success in their depredations. The most serious of these attempts occurred near the close of Alfred's life, and will be hereafter described. The generosity and the nobleness of mind which Alfred manifested in his treatment of Guntram made a great impression upon mankind at the time, and have done a great deal to elevate the character of our hero in every subsequent age. All admire such generosity in others, however slow they may be to practice it in themselves. It seems a very easy virtue 
when we look upon an exhibition of it like this, where we feel no special resentments ourselves against the person thus nobly forgiven. We find it, however, a very hard virtue to practice when a case occurs requiring the exercise of it towards a person who has done us an injury. Let those who think that in Alfred's situation they should have acted as he did look around upon the circle of their acquaintance and see whether it is easy for them to pursue a similar course towards their personal enemies, those who have thwarted and circumvented them in their plans or slandered them or treated them with insult and injury. By observing how hard it is to change our own resentments to feelings of forgiveness and goodwill, we can better appreciate Alfred's treatment of Gunther. Alfred was famed during his life for the kindness of his heart, and a thousand stories were told in his day of his interpositions to right the wrong, to relieve the distress, to comfort the afflicted, and to befriend the unhappy. On one occasion, as it is said, when he was hunting in a wood, he heard the piteous cries of a child, which seemed to come from the air above his head. It was found, after much looking and listening, that the sounds proceeded from an eagle's nest upon the top of a lofty tree. On climbing to the nest, they found the child within, screaming with pain and terror. The eagle had carried it there in its talons for a prey. Alfred brought down the boy, and after making fruitless inquiries to find his father and mother, adopted him for his own son, gave him a good education, and provided for him well in his future life. The story was all, very probably, a fabrication, but the characters of men are sometimes very strikingly indicated by the kind of stories that are invented concerning them. End of chapter 10 Recording by Ryan Cherry